Okay, I guess we can get started. What I'm going to do today is uh, give you some new material and then I'm going to review because I understand I heard through the rumor mill that you have an exam on Thursday. No? Oh, oh, I see. I'm, I really must have heard the rumors incorrectly then, yeah. <laughs> but um, the first, uh, so I have a couple of questions that people have asked. I want to answer one or two of them first. And then what I want to do is uh, introduce, sh uh, show you the muscle power of what you have so far. Now, the first one is in the notes right here. I have that delta x is uh, normally distributed with the mean zero and variance delta t. And in the notes, I asked the following question to find the um, PDF for delta x squared. You know why you want the PDF for delta x squared? That's because that's part of the statement of saying is it coming in, you know, because we have that statement that, <coughs> that delta x, the expected value of delta x squared is delta t, and we want to know with probability 1 what delta x squared is hanging around. That's part of our derivation of the Black-Scholes equation, if you recall. So let's take a look and see how we would find the PDF for delta x squared. Actually, it's pretty straightforward. That's because for delta x, the PDF for delta x is 1 over root 2 pi delta t, the square root of this, e to the minus x minus 0 over squared over 2 delta t. There's the PDF for, there's the PDF for delta x. Remember this? A variance is delta t, so therefore the standard deviation is going to be the square root of delta t. And we computed in class that if I have a, that what happens is uh, with the change of variables, I have delta t here, I have, that's the variance, so there's the standard deviation, 2 pi, etc. Okay, everybody with me on this? And this is just uh, where I'm just using for sigma the root delta t. Root delta, yeah, root delta t. So now I want to find what is the PDF for delta x squared. So I want to fi find, find the PDF for delta x squared. And we remember what we do, how we handle this. We find the cumulative distribution and then we differentiate it. So we find the cumulative distribution, and then we differentiate it. So this means I want to find the probability that delta x squared is less than or equal to x, where x is small x. Uh, let's make that s. Make that S so we don't get the variables screwed up here. And once I know what that is, then I'm going to just differentiate it. And what is this equal? Uh, first thing we notice is that 0 is less than S. 0 is less than S. So S always has to be non-negative. Next, what we do is the standard approach of rewriting this in terms of what we do know. Minus root s less than or equal to delta x less than or equal to root s. Because if delta x squared is less than s, then delta x, I have to get it down to delta s delta x. And so I have to take the square root of both sides. And once I do that, I have a delta s minus delta s minus root delta s and plus root delta s on the other sides that bound it. And now I know what this is. Let's see if I can find a darker pen. I now know what this is. 
because I have the PDF over here. This is equal to 1 over root 2 pi delta t. I'm putting the root delta t in here. The integral from minus square root of s to the square root of s e to the minus x minus 0 squared over uh, 2 delta t dx. Okay, everybody with me on this? Okay, and so let's just write down what that is again. <clears throat> we have to find this cumulative distribution here. If I can find this cumulative distribution, I just have to differentiate it. What is delta x? <clears throat> I have to get this down in terms of delta x, and so that's what I have here. And what is this? Well, I just substitute it into the cumulative distribution. This is finding the probability that delta x lies between these two values, and that's equal to this right here. And so there is the value for the cumulative distribution for delta x squared. All that remains is to differentiate go home and celebrate, okay? And so if I differentiate this then, I have that the PDF is, well, I'm going to have one over root two pi delta t, I'm gonna put that out in the front. Now I'm gonna differentiate this and it's going to be e everywhere I see an x, I'm gonna put in this. So that's going to be e to the minus s over 2 delta t times the differential of this, which is going to be 1 half s to the minus 1 half minus the lower root. That's going to be e to the minus s over delta t, 2 delta t. And when I differentiate this, I'm going to have minus 1 over s minus one-half s to the minus one-half power. These two minuses, that minus is going to cancel, and we just add these two together, and I have the answer. And here is my PDF. So you see it looked, when you read the notes, it looked like, oh my God, how am I going to get that? Ah, just like you get everything else. Pretty straightforward. You don't know how to handle problems, but you know the, uh, the general principle, plug it into the general principle, turn that heavy crank, and pop out the answer. Okay? And that's essentially what we do. Any questions on this one right here? Okay. Now, before I answer, uh, uh, any, any questions on this before I do something else? Okay. Um, Another, um, see, one of the problems and when, excuse me, let's go back to this. Once you have this PDF, then what you do is you can show that everything is going to, uh, very, very rapidly. Very, very rapidly. Uh, the variance is getting very, very small, and that's because as delta t gets small, this gets very, very large, and so everything just squeezes in right, quite rapidly, is what happens. And that is the statement that I made that <coughs> delta x is approaching, or delta x squared is approaching the value of delta t for smaller and smaller values of delta t. That's because you have that delta t in the denominator everywhere, and it tries to speed everything up rapidly. It's just like the normal curve, right? The normal curve, the variance is smaller, it squeezes in rapidly, and that's what this does. So does this answer your question? Good. All right. Now, power, power, power. Rather than giving you a large number of formulae to memorize and then forget as soon as you walk out of the exam, 
What we've been doing is deriving the different formulas. We've been deriving and finding out why they're so, and the really the goal is to understand how you can use it when you encounter problems in the real world. Because after all, remember the goal is for each and every one of you to become successful. So let's take a new problem, an absolute problem that you haven't seen yet. And let's at least try to use the tools that we have to try to figure out how we can handle it. Here's the problem. Bonds. With a bond, what is it that you have? The value of a bond depends on the expiration date, March 14th. We all know March 14th is the big one for this class. Last day of class is 13th, actually, here. So the March 14th. And then the question is, it also depends on the current interest rate. Now, you know nothing. Who knows something about bonds here? That's what I thought. One person. Uh, and he only tentatively raised his hand. OK, you know nothing about bonds. And yet, you've got to find something for your boss by this evening. So what are you going to do? Google. <laughs> Google. <laughs> That's, one, that's a good place to start, quite frankly. But what are you going to do here? Uh, what are we trying to find? We're going to have to try to find the value, of, the value of the bond. Now, how do we find the value of a call or a put? Pardon? The value of a call or a put. Yeah. Remember, we found the value of a call or a put with, that bar, with the Black-Scholes equation. So how are we going to do that here? <laughs> no, you. <laughs> no way. OK. See, there, there's a difficulty here. How did we find the, you have to find something to compare it, right? You need a comparison. So what was the comparison for a call or a put? The comparison was the value of the asset, right? Because the way we handle the call or a put is that we started off with call S T and we said let's compare it, let's hedge, let's compare it with the asset. And really as I stated we started off thinking of this as hedging. But the real purpose of the hedge was to try to find what is the right balance between the current value of the asset and the option, the call or the put. So that's really the purpose of setting this up and then going through the equations. Now we run into a problem. The problem is that if I write a bond, I cannot hedge on the interest rate. I cannot hedge on the interest rate. How am I, how am I going to get money back on the interest rate? How are you going to hedge on, uh, what is today, the 4th? How are you going to hedge on March 4th? Not very successfully. And so you have a problem here. The problem is you can't hedge on the interest rate. So what are you going to do, other than sit back and say, he's going to give me the answer in a few seconds? <laughs> okay. Any ideas? And, uh, with, the stocks, sir? with what? With the stocks. Sir. Over the stocks, or he's saying, let's do it with some surrogate. Let's do it with a surrogate, is essentially what he's saying. He said, if we can't use that, at least lose something else. So let's use a surrogate for the interest rate. 
And what we're going to use is another bond that also depends on the interest rate. So I'm going to have bond T, interest rate T, minus alpha, bond with a different expiration date. A different expiration date. They're both going to depend on the interest rate, aren't they? From what I told you. From what little you know about it and from what I told you. And so what we do then is we have the interest rate So there is my hedge. And remember what the purpose of this hedge is. The purpose of this hedge is to try to find how is the price of that bond going to change with changes in the interest rate. That's really what the purpose of the hedge, just like the hedge for the Black Shoals, was to try to find how does the uh, price of the option, the value of the option, how does that change with values of the price of the asset, or the stock, or whatever it is we're talking about. And so what we're doing here is I would love to have, I would love to take, to use this equation right over here, that the bond is, I'm hedging the bond on the interest rate. That just doesn't make sense. So I find a surrogate for this. I replace it with something. That also depends on the interest rate. Maybe a bond from the same bridge or whatever the bond is for. But what I'm going to do is with a different expiration date. So both of them are affected in the same way. All right, so there I have my portfolio. All right, now we got another problem. The other problem is, how does the interest rate change? I could write down, I could write down for a first, uh, for a first cut that the interest rate, that the interest rate changes like, um, oh, this one's useless that the interest rate changes like, uh, just like um, uh, the value of S, I could write down that delta R is equal to mu R delta T plus sigma R delta X. I could write that down. Uh, but I'm not so sure about this equation. I'm not so sure about this equation. I'm not so sure that the interest rate is going to jump up proportionally to what the current interest rate is now. I mean, come on, if the interest rate is 10%, do you think it's going to go up a proportion, or do you think it's going to, ah, we're up pretty high, we better not let it go up too high. And so therefore, this equation right here is questionable. So let's do the following. Let's write this as, let's see, FG. G of R of, uh, G of R delta T plus, again here, uh, G H. H of R delta X. What are G and H? Oh, I don't know. I haven't got the slightest idea. What happens is uh, she's taking a statistics course. I don't know if you are or not. Are you? No. She's going to be taking a statistics course. <laughs> okay. And in this course, she's going to discover how to use the data to figure out what is the right choice for G and R, H. So in other words, that's one of the things which you busily study, finding ways to get these answers. Okay, folks. You know what the next step is. The next step is to use Ito's lemma and to give me the equation. It is to use Ito's lemma
and find the hedge rate. Find the value between the two bonds that you should use to try to understand the values, what's going on. Go ahead. Yep. So if you're using a bond to figure out the value of another bond, Yep. and if somebody wrongly values the, the original bond that everybody is basically yep. them off, then wouldn't that cause a yep. collapse? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... So you've got to use something else. You have to then hedge it against something else. Isn't that what we did on the call and the put? Right. We hedged it. Uh, first, we hedged it versus uh, the asset and the option. Right. Yeah. And then we worried about, oh, is everything overvalued? So then we hedged it versus the bank. Right. So we can do something similar to that here. Okay. So go ahead, uh, uh, because this is the type of a question which you might expect to see on Tuesday, Thursday. Because what, for the uh, Eto's Lemma, you have a different kind of Eto's Lemma. And I want you to, uh, well, you can use Eto's Lemma straight out, but you're going to get a different equation, different expression. A bigger pardon? Do we need to know the distribution for delta r? Uh, I, the only thing, no, I don't have any idea of the distribution for, uh, oh, but I have for delta x. Delta x is, as always, over there. Okay. So since delta x is as over there, I didn't take it off purposely, you can immediately write down the expression, pretty much the expression, for delta f of rt. Okay, because you know what terms are going to drop out and what terms are not. Possible question on Thursday is to justify what terms drop out and what terms do not. So the first step on using Eto's lemma is I have f of r t, and I need to find an expression for delta f. Okay, let's get, uh, start writing down some things here. I know from Taylor's series that delta F is going to be the partial of F with respect to R, delta R, plus the partial of F with respect to T, delta T, plus one half the second partial of F with respect to R, delta R squared, plus the partial of F with respect to R with respect to T, delta R, delta T, plus one half the second partial of F with respect to T, delta T squared. Argument is precisely the same as you did, precisely the same as you did earlier. Okay, you just find what terms are small. Remember my story about my beautiful, uh, what color Lamborghini did I have? I forgot. What, what? Black. Black, oh, I got a, oh, you gave me a new one. I got a nice shiny black Lamborghini, okay? And what happens is I got to watch driving on roads because I don't want a pebble to hit it, okay? Although, no, no, that was a Ferrari. Was there somebody hit a football player, a former football player, this last week and took a baseball bat and went after his 300,000 Ferrari. <laughs> Did you read about that? 
He happens to be a football player that was uh, for the Dolphins, and I won't go any further. Uh, but what happens is, uh, I don't want to get a pebble mark on my uh, Lamborghini. Okay, so that's delta T. I don't mind bug spray. That's delta T squared, or something smaller than delta T. So we get rid of things that are smaller than delta T. That's going to be my measure. So what we do is we get rid of anything which is delta T times something small. Anything delta T times something small, we can get rid of it. That means that I can get rid of delta T is small, delta T is small, I can get rid of that. Delta T is small, delta R, delta R, delta R. If I multiply delta T times delta R, I'm going to get a delta T squared. And I'm going to have a delta X, delta T, delta X is small. That's going to be small. Ah, it's too small. Get rid of it. The only thing that remains, the only thing that remains is the delta R term. So I have to compute that. And I have the delta R squared is going to give me, where is delta R? There it is. It's going to give me G squared delta T squared plus 2 G H delta T delta R plus uh, what did I get wrong here? Plus uh, uh, oh, plus H squared delta X. You're right. Uh, H squared delta X squared. There we go. There we go. I'm multiplying all of this out. And so now we say, what's small? What's so small I can uh, ignore it? Well, this is small. Ignore that. This is small. Ignore that. And we've gone through the argument many, many times that delta x squared behaves, and that was the PDF that we started off today, delta x squared behaves like delta t. And so I can replace this with delta t. And so when I do so, I have the expression for delta f. It is going to be the partial of f with respect to r, delta r, plus the partial of f with respect to t, delta t, plus, okay, the only thing surviving in here is this h squared delta t, plus one half h squared of r, the second partial of f with respect to r, delta t. Okay, everybody with me on that? So you see that you have a different Eto's lemma with a different delta S, which is what we already know from other problems. In this case, delta R. And so there I have the expression. There I have the expression. What we had earlier <coughs> was sigma, sigma S right here, and that was sigma squared S squared right here. Now it's just H squared. So it is consistent with what we had. Now what I want to do is I want to use that to find the alpha value. So I'm going to let f equal t r t minus alpha b t2 r t. So this I'm checking, I'm changing, blah, 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 blah. I have a surrogate for the bond for the interest rate, which is another bond. 
with a different expiration date on the same thing. They're both for bridges, for example. And so what I'm doing is I have the two of them, just different expiration dates, and we just go through this. Any questions? Okay. So now all we have to do is find how is the bond changing, the value of this thing right here changing, and that's going to give me how these two things right here compare. So delta F is going to be the partial of this with respect to R. minus alpha B T2 with respect to R, all times delta R plus the partial of B with respect to T minus alpha, partial of B T2 with respect to T delta T, plus one-half h squared, the second partial of b with respect to r minus the second minus alpha, the second partial of b t2 with respect to r delta t. There's the ugly, ugly, ugly mess you get. Hey, you're getting an answer anyway. You'll keep your job. Okay. Any questions so far? All righty. So now what I want to do is this next step is to eliminate explicit risk. Eliminate explicit risk. There's always an implicit one, but eliminate explicit risk. And where does the risk come in that we cannot handle? Delta X. delta X, as always, the delta X is the random term. So we want to eliminate the random term. And the only way we're going to take a look here, where is the random term crop up? The random term crops up in delta R. That's where the random term crops up. So I've got to get rid of the delta R. Okay, everybody with me? And so this means I'm going to choose partial of V of T with respect to R minus alpha partial of V of T2 with respect to R, I'm going to set this equal to zero. And what it tells me then, it tells me that the ratio between the two is going to be the partial of VT with respect to R divided by the partial of VT2 with respect to R. That's the hedge rate. That's much like what we started off with, with a gamble between San Diego and Denver. If somebody bet a little bit more, you wanted to get that ratio, that bounce better. And this right here is the bounce. So this gives you the value of it. It captures a surrogate capture of how the bond is affected by changes in the interest rate. Because the change in the interest rate is going to change all the other variables. Okay, any questions? Now to get a Black-Scholes equation, you just set it equal to something on the market. We did interest rates in the bank. Maybe you have a different interest rate. You have an interest rate for the bonds and interest rate on the market, and you could set that equal to what you would do in the, uh, in the market. And you would get your, uh, 
you know, on the banks. And so what you can do is you would have a different interest rate, put them in, solve that equation in the same way, and you have a new Black-Scholes equation. Ugly, but you got an equation. So what's the point? The point number one is this is one of the ways in which they analyze, one of the ways in which they analyze bonds, futures, various other type things. Pollution. Suppose you had a problem on pollution. No problem. You just find, uh, I got to find a surrogate for pollution. Well, pollution is going to change what? It's going to change the rate of uh, cost of a new car, one of these new cars that has to have the pollution. So I have that. I'm going to, and then I want to find out uh, but how does pollution change. Well, you write down the equation. You find a surrogate for pollution. Maybe that's um, smog control type uh, devices, masks, <laughs> whatever you want to have. So what you do is you just uh, have a surrogate for it. You put it together and you have it. The point is, rather than memorizing a bunch of equations that you know you're going to forget, by understanding how to derive these equations, you can handle a large number of other issues, many other issues. Because what you can do then is just say, well, to find the value of this, I need to find it compared to the value of something else. That's what we did with C minus alpha S. That's what we're doing with the bonds, bonds at two different expiration dates, so we can find the interest rate. Whatever problem you encounter, what you can do is just substitute those terms in there. And you can find the relative value of one versus the other. Okay, so in other words, that's a tool that you want to use. It's a tool you want to take away from this course. Second thing is, is that once I get the expression, because this, the expression now of this term right here is going to drop out. This term is going to drop out. He raised the question, though, suppose somebody screwed up in pricing the bonds. Well, the bonds aren't the only thing. People are looking elsewhere in the market. That's how we're going to adjust the bond market. We're looking elsewhere. What can I do? Take my money, get rid of the bonds, and go short on them and buy money and go elsewhere. So what you're going to do then is once you have that, you're going to set this equal to something in the market delta T. You set it equal to something in the market, delta T. It doesn't have to be money from a bank. We use that as a surrogate also for what's going on in the market. But it doesn't have to be that. It can be anything you want. It should be safe, right? Pardon? The right hand side should be safe, so you can like, surely to own money from that side, right? Yeah, I, that I can take the money from the left-hand side, put it into the right-hand side. That's something to make my money there, correct? but elsewhere in the market. And so what I'm doing is I am, in that way right there, I'm adjusting between what happens with bonds, things like this, and what happens elsewhere in the market is what I'm doing on here. And so uh, what we're doing is we're getting a, um, a nice comparison, which is what you need to do. And that's what the double hedge comes in. It's to find out how does this bond change with respect to interest? I don't know. So you find a surrogate for the interest. And then you find how does uh, these bonds, if everything's screwed up, how do they uh, function relative to the market? And so I find something as a surrogate for the market. Money in the bank, whatever you want to have. Doesn't matter what it is. Okay? So in this way, you can handle a large number of problems that you will never see in any course book. You just take this general principle, this general principle, carry it out, and to get at least a first, uh, get a, at least a first uh, take on what's going on. Any questions on this? So a question you might see on an exam is a pollution problem, like the one I gave you, or something else of this type, and to try to find what is the difference between it. Or uh, if I'm creative enough, I'll come up with something wilder. Second point. Second point. We said that the value of the asset is going to be mu s, mu s delta t plus sigma s delta x. <laughs> I 
I can see him busily going through the computation. But we had delta S equals mu S delta T plus sigma S delta X. Is that the correct form? In the short term, yeah. In the long term, probably not. Probably not. No problem. If you have something else, if the other people in your firm say, no, 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 what's going to happen is that delta S is equal to some function of GST delta T plus some function delta X. And folks, they do, particularly right here, because this right here changes the variance of the market based on observations. So if they say that that is going to be what happens, you say, but, 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 it's not in my book. No problem. You derive Eto's lemma just like we got through doing. You get the new Eto's lemma and you substitute it in. No problem. And so in this case, what you would have is you would have the Eto's lemma would be would be delta F of S partial of F with respect to S delta S H of S T squared, et cetera. And you would have that equation. That's all. So you know how to get it. In other words, what I'm telling you is that what we do in a course, sure a long ways away from what you'll have to do in the market. But you've got the tools, that's the important thing, is you have the tools that you can look at these situations and say, what can I do? What can I do to get an answer? Okay? Any questions? All right. Here's one. Once you get an equation, a partial differential equation, you say, oh my God. Now what do I do? I don't know how to solve that. How do I solve that equation? Well, let me tell you folks, if every little molecule of dust or air in this room would be in an important partial differential equation, the ones we know how to solve will fit right on the top of this blue lid right here, that's all. The rest of them we don't know how to solve to get a nice analytic solution to the type we did. But your boss is saying, I want an answer by this evening. And so you need another surrogate. You need something else. You need something else to be able to solve those problems because it's just not going to be done by trying to get an analytic solution or looking through a lot of books. You'll get an uh, equation like the one I have for the bonds there when you put in something else on the market. You're not going to find a solution of that. So the question is, is you need to get some numerical numbers. You need some numerical numbers, a numerical solution for the problem. So I'm going to outline how to do that. And we're going to do it with the heat equation because that's a little easier. Everything is going to be the same. First, are there any questions about this before I erase this? All right. Now, one of our tools that we used, have used a time, time, time again in this course is Taylor series. Taylor series. And so from Taylor series, I want to come up with a numerical scheme. And the numerical scheme that I want to do is I want to use it to give me, I mean, there's all sorts of clever, clever approaches out there. I'm giving you just a crude one that you can put on Excel and you can get some numbers. If you're interested in this, take a course in it because you'll get many sophisticated ways. I want to solve this equation right here. The heat equation, and we know the heat equation is tied in 
with respect to the uh, Black-Scholes equation. And let's say that the equi uh, answer is that the x at time zero of x is equal to x squared. So I have a bar going between zero and one. And let's say it's equal to zero here, and it's equal to 100 here in Celsius. So what do we have? I know that between 0 and 1, I know that when I start, what's the temperature of the bar? I want to find what's the temperature of the bar on the interior. At this point, right there in particular, right there. I want to find out what's the temperature of the bar. So the way we do this is we put it down into discrete. U of T X plus K minus U of T X is equal to the partial of U of T X with respect to X times K plus small o of K. That's just Taylor series. That's just Taylor series. It says the change in u in the x direction is going to be the partial of u times the change in x. Okay. Any questions on this? Yeah. Sorry, wasn't that inside of the first I have, um, so let's go through this. I have u of t, this right here is just a heat equation. Oh, I just, I just can't read it. Oh, all right, so let me make it larger. What I'm doing is I'm just using Taylor series, and that is going to be u of t x plus k. I'm writing down essentially the definition of what, how I define the partial derivative. Okay. Oh, oh, excuse me. I want to get u of t. Let's do, let's do u of t. I'm sorry. Let's erase this right here. I'll come back to this in a few seconds. But let's take u of t. I need a representative for u of t is what I need. So, the, so I, want, I know that I could write u t plus k x, okay? I'm just going to write down the Taylor series expansion. Nothing else. Too nice of a day to get anything dif difficult. This is going to be equal to u of t x plus the partial of u with respect to t at t x k plus terms that are small o of k, meaning these terms right here go to zero. That's, you know, as k gets small, those terms are even smaller, like k squared. Okay, see that one? Okay. So that's just using nothing more than the definition of the partial derivative. Okay, so now I have a representation when I solve this, I have a representation for u of tx. Well, I'm, I'll just leave this as it is right here. Uh, u of minus u of tx plus equals u of t plus k x minus u of t x over k plus terms that go to zero. Okay, just solving, just writing down the definition. Okay, 
Any questions on this one right here? Uh, first, I need a partial with respect to t here. But uh, this is small o of 1. I'm dividing everything by k. So if this was k squared, this will be k then. So this, is, this just means small, small terms I can ignore. When I divide by k, these are small terms that I can ignore. OK? And that's o of 1 plus o of 1, yeah. Then I have small o, meaning very small. Okay, any other questions? So now I have a representation for this one right here. What I need is a representation for this. If I have the representations, I just plug them into the equations and see what I can do with it. All righty. To do this, I'm going to, if I use the Taylor series, for the first equation, I can use a Taylor series for the second equation. So I have u of t x plus h equals u of t x plus the partial of u with respect to x times h plus the second partial of u with respect to x times h squared plus terms that are very, very small compared to h squared. So all I'm doing is writing down the Taylor series. Nothing, nothing, nothing imagined today. Too much June gloom to be my adjective today. Okay. Now what do I do is let's do it again. I don't like this equation, so let's do it again. U of t x minus h equals u of t h plus u of t with respect to x times minus h plus the second derivative of u with respect to x h squared. Yes? Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. H squared. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I get a C for today, he gets an A. Okay, <laughs> everybody with me? Notice what I have, yeah. I have a question. I didn't understand why. When we make, uh, when we reason over x, uh, we go up to the second order term, while uh, when we reason over oh, t. Oh, he's asking an excellent question. He's saying, why in the world did I only go to the first order term here and I'll go to the second order term here? That's because I had the first order term here and I got the second order term here. Ah, okay. <laughs> if I had a third order term, what do you think I'd do? <laughs> yeah, I'd go to the third order. Got it. <laughs> okay. Now, let's add those two equations together. When you add these two equations together, wow, I got an h and a minus h, and they cancel out. I got an h and a minus h, they cancel out. I got a one half plus a one half, thanks to him, which add up to being equal to one. And then I have these equations here. So I'm going to have u of t x plus h plus u of t x minus h equals 2u of t x, these terms cancel out, plus 1, oops, that's equal to 1, they add up here, second partial of u with respect to x squared, h squared, plus small terms, let's forget the small terms. And now you know what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to try to find them to stick into that equation. I already have an expression for the partial of u with respect to t, so find an expression for the second partial of x with respect, uh, of u with respect to x. And so I want to solve here. And when I solve, I get that the second partial of u with respect to x is equal to u of t x plus h minus 2 u of t x plus u of t x minus h all over h squared. Okay, and so now let's put them into this equation here and to see what happens. I'm going to have to lose my boundary conditions, but we'll get them back. So in place of the u of t, I'm going to write in u of t plus k x minus u of tx over k equals the second partial. The second partial is that term over there. U of t plus u of t x plus h minus 2 u of t x plus u of t x plus minus h all over h squared. And you see, all I have done here is just use Taylor series a couple of times. That's all I've done is use Taylor series a couple of times. And then uh, to find representations, and that's just plug and chug. Now what I want to do is I multiply everything through by I want to get rid of this term here, so multiply everything through by k. And I get a k over here. That will drop up when I multiply by k, and I get a k over here. I just got rid of the k here. So now what is it that we have? I have an expression that looks to the future. I have an expression that looks to the future. Let's see why. Here is an expression that looks what's going on today at time t and at position x. Here's something that looks at what's happening at time t, something that's looking at time t, something that's looking at time t. Everything is looking at what happens now. And I have another term that looks what's happening in the future. Another term that says what's happening in the future. So if, since this looks in the future, if I solve for this one right here, most surely I can then get an expression that I can use to find how current events are influencing future events. And so when I do this, I'm going to have u of t plus k, x is equal to alpha, where alpha is equal to h, uh, k over h squared, of u of 
T x plus h minus 2u of t x plus u of t x minus h, alpha mu uh, multiplying by all of that, that's that small term, plus u of t x. All I did, just cancel terms and solve for what I want to know in the future, because I want to know what happens in the future. I know it's happening now, I want to know what happens in the future. And so what does this equation tell me? This equation tells me that to find out this is what's happening at location x right now and at this time. And what this equation tells me is that what's going to happen at location x in the future is that I'm going to take this time, what the heat is right now, and I'm going to augment it by this amount right here, how much is coming from the left and the right. Okay? According to that equation. So let's write it down and let's see how to use this. Everybody see this right here, where this came from? Because all I did to get this equation right here is I just wrote, to, used the Taylor series three times, collected terms to find expressions, discrete expressions for all of these terms, and one of the expressions tells me something that's going to happen in the future, t plus k. Now there's something I haven't told you, and that is that alpha has to be small. Okay? So, suppose k is equal to 0.1. I'm going to do now is I'm going to rewrite this whole thing, the information we have, to see what happens. Here is t, here is x, remember u of zero x is equal to x squared between zero and one. Let's make it between zero and 10 so I can use, uh, no, nah, zero one's fine. Then I have it zero degrees down here and I have 100 Celsius over here. What I want to find out, here's point one half. I want to find out what's going to happen a little bit in the future. So this is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, etc. in the future. So I want to find out what is going to be the heat at one-tenth in the future. So what I have is that's K. So k is small, so k is one-tenth, h, I want h squared k to be small, so let's say h is equal to one-half. That'll be still small. Not as small as I would like, but it's small. Okay, and so what is alpha? Alpha is going to equal then one-tenth divided by one-fourth, which is going to be equal to uh, four over ten, which is equal to two-fifths. And in practice, you choose much smaller numbers. All right. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. One half is too large. Let's make this, uh, let's make, uh, make this one hundredth, and let's make this one, uh, one tenth. One, uh, not tenth, that's too small. Um, one fifth. Okay, so therefore this is one over 25. This is one 
hundredth over one over 25. That's 25 over 100. That's equal to one fourth. All righty. So what does it say we have to do? It says I go down, uh, h is one fifth. So I go down a fifth from here, and I go up a fifth from here. So this is one half minus a fifth. Okay. And this is one half plus a fifth. So this is x, this is x plus h, this is x minus h. Okay, everybody with me on that? So what do we have? Is I have one half plus one fifth. That's five tenths and that's um, so, uh, two tenths is equal to seven tenths. So this is the number seven tenths. And this is the number um, uh, five, three, three tenths. So to find what is going to be the temperature right here, what's going to be the temperature right here, I compute this, I compute this, I compute this. So let's do that. I will have, what was my alpha? My alpha is one fourth. So I have alpha is equal to one fourth. I will have, this is equal to one fourth u of zero of x at seven tenths minus two u of zero x at one half plus u of zero uh, x at three tenths. All of that plus what is the current temperature at one half. It's just substitution, nothing more than substitution. Okay? And that's how you get the answers. Okay, so let's go through this again. We got this equation right here just by finding the partial, I mean the Taylor series and cross multiplying. I know I need the alpha term to be small, which means that h has to be small, but alpha has to be much smaller. Once I have that, I can find out what's going to be, what is going to be the temperature. I can find what's going to be the temperature at one one hundredth of one half. That's going to equal this right here, this expression right here. So, the, so it says that the temperature, the current temperature right here is going to be the temperature here as modified by what happens here, what happens here, and what happens here. And all of this is, is just plug and chug now. This is going to equal one-fourth. This temperature right here is going to equal seven tenths squared minus one half squared plus three tenths squared, all multiplied by the one fourth plus one half squared. And that's going to be the temperature at a tenth, a uh, hundredth of a second later. Okay, everybody with me on that? Not hard. And again, what this does is it tells you how, yeah, it tells you how to use these, how to use the tools that you learned in this class here to go beyond what was taught in the class. Okay, so what's going to be on the exam? I will try to make sure that every topic 
that we covered since the last exam will be on the new one. I will try also. What, what it, that we did today is going to be on the exam. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> One of the things is going to be is how you can use the power of what we have done. Ito's lemma. You can expect something like we did with bonds to be on the exam. What about the numerical integration? You need time to carry out some computations. That will be on the final, not on the exam. So this right here will be, and I'll go over more examples of this type on Tuesday, but that will be on the final exam. It will not be on the test on Thursday because those are the type of calculations you've got to go about four or five examples before you understand what's going on. So, but the first part you should know. You should know because we've worked out so many examples others. I'm just showing you that what we worked out, the reason we worked it out is so that you have the muscle power to handle new problems. So like pretty much up until that part right there? Yeah, right up to there. Have. Yeah. Okay. But, and I will give you notes on Tuesday. I don't have notes right now on the bonds, but I'll give you notes on the weekend uh, in terms of the numerical integration. Or if I, I might have them, if I have them, I'll send them out now, but you don't need them until after that. And what we can do is uh, we'll have that for exam. We'll work on some of those things there and on dividends on there. Now, yes? Probably. Probably, but I want to do one thing now just because this is the type of question that will be on the exam and I was asked to carry it out. And that is to explain what happens, what happens to the uh, value of a call or a put as sigma goes to zero. What happens, now you need to know the equations, you need to know the equations, you're not going to be given them. But the value of a call, and a way to remember the value of a call is, as I stated, we know that at expiration date, this is S minus E. We know that at some time prior to the uh, call, instead of E, it should be the present value of E. And we know that it has to be modified by what's going on in the market. And we know the value of D1 and D2. These are, tells, these are the terms that tell us what's going on in the market, etc. D1 is going to be the natural log. Now, in the notes, and, as, uh, and in the last class period, or maybe last meeting, last time or the time before, the time before that, this was written as S E E to the minus R T minus T right here over sigma root T minus T plus sigma root T minus T. And D2 is the same thing except you get a minus here. S over E, E to the minus R, T minus T over sigma root T minus T uh, plus, uh, minus sigma root T minus T. Now what I want to know is what happens as the market gets dead, as sigma goes to zero. As sigma goes to zero, as sigma goes to zero, this term goes to zero. This term goes to zero. This term goes to zero. So the dominant term, as sigma goes to zero, is going to be this and this. All right? 
So if that happens, then what we have are two situations. We have the situation, is the numerator positive or is it negative? If it's positive, then D1 goes to infinity, D2 goes to infinity. So if, if S over E, E to the minus R, T minus T, if this right here is greater than one, that's what it takes for this to be positive, then what happens is that D1 and D2 go to infinity. Remember, that just means that the price is larger than the current value, the present value of E. If D1 and D2 go to infinity, then N of D1 and N of D2 go go to unity. And if that happens, then we have that the value of the call, the value of the call is approaching S minus, that's going to unity, E, E to the minus R, T minus T. It's approaching the present value, the difference between the price of the asset and the present value of E. Now, if the present, if that natural log term is negative, so S is smaller than the present value of E, then the numerator is negative. Now it's going to minus infinity, as you stated, and if it goes to minus infinity, then what happens is D1 goes to minus infinity, D2 goes to minus infinity, and if D1 goes to zero, and, uh, N of D2 goes to zero, so the value of the call just disappears. It's equal to zero. And the reason is, there's not much going on. There's not much going on. If there's not much going on, then we look at the difference between the stock, the current value of the stock, and the present value of the strike price, and it looks like it's gonna stay there. So if S is smaller than the present value, Hey, if it's going to just stay there, everything looks useless. So the call's worth nothing. If what happens, it's above there, well, I can get the difference. I can sell it and get, you know, the difference between the two. And so that's what we have there. So you have one practice exam. Questions of this type right here can be expected, including questions of finding the partial derivatives, which is what we had on one of your homework assignments, you know, the partial of C with respect to S, sigma, and different things. Remember the American option. Remember the American option. You can expect that also. And uh, you know the admission price. The admission price is a big blue book, a large blue book. <laughs>